Okay, hello to everyone who's here with us on this special Haaretz Zoom briefing with Dr. Sharon Ray Price. Uh, Dr. Price, hello. Thank you for being Hi. with us today. Um, My pleasure. We are honored to have Dr. Uh, Sharon Ray Price, the top public health expert at Israel's Ministry of Health, with us today. Dr. Ray Price has become a household name in Israel over the past two years as she's been at the front of Israel's battle with COVID really from the earliest days of the pandemic. And she has also unfortunately um, become the target of uh, vicious and uh, frankly dangerous attacks by anti-vaccine activists who are a small minority here in Israel, but a very vocal one. And later we'll also talk about that, but it's definitely not the focus of our conversation because we have more important uh, questions that we've been getting from our readers at hearts.com for weeks now um, that really Dr. Alray Price is the most suited person to answer. Uh, and we've been getting these questions for weeks about Israel and COVID. Um, the whole world right now is really looking at what is happening here in Israel. The first country in the world that initiated a countrywide booster shots campaign and one of the first to start child vaccinations between the ages of five and 11, an issue that is now making headlines in Israel as we speak. Uh, Dr. Alrori Price, I want to start by asking you about what is happening right now in the COVID numbers here in Israel, because just a few weeks ago, we were all celebrating the big success of the boosters, and we were talking about the, how they crushed the Delta wave. And in recent days, we're seeing again a slow but steady uptick of cases here in Israel. What is going on? So um, it's a great question. I'll say that we're still celebrating the booster effect. I think uh, uh, we have shown that uh, the booster is needed. There is waning immunity over time. And uh, we obviously were the first to see this just because Israel was the first to immunize uh, very efficiently a high proportion of the population very early on in our third wave. And so we were the first to experience the, the waning and we were the first to see that the booster has this enormous effect and it still does. Uh, but what we do have still is about a million uh, citizens who got their two shots but did not come to get their uh, third shot and their immunity is waning. Uh, we still have roughly uh, 600,000 people uh, who have never gotten the first and second shots. Uh, so they are not covered, they're not immunized. And we still have a large population of kids. Uh, Israel is a young country. And so we have a large population of kids, roughly 1.2 million um, that are under the age of 12. And so they're not covered. So we still have a large proportion of the population uh, not immunized. And what we're seeing in uh, the confirmed cases in uh, these days is that about three quarters of them are people who are not immunized at all. And another 15% are people who have been immunized, but uh, with waning immunity. So more than six months has passed since their second shot. And so roughly 90% of the confirmed cases right now are non-immunized individuals. So it's it's still, it's not the booster waning, it's the it's the, the fact that we still have uh, non-immunized individuals, whether be, uh, they were not immunized to begin with or had waning immunity from the second shot. Critical explanation because as we know, everything that happens here in Israel becomes part of the global culture war around vaccines these days and arguments uh, about what is happening here become conversation in very popular platforms outside. I want to remind everyone who is watching us on Facebook Live and uh, on Zoom that you can also send us uh, questions. Um, here on Zoom, you can type them via the chat function and you can also uh, send uh, us via uh, replies. Um, and Dr. Price will answer some of the questions uh, later in our conversation. What was the rationale Dr. Price of starting the booster campaign. What caused Israel to become the first country to take this huge gamble that today, again, like you said, we celebrate, we talk about it as a success, but at the time of the decision was quite controversial. It was not- It was uh, not a gamble at all. It, it mm -hmm. was not a gamble at all. It was uh, us scientists and physicians, we're not gambling. We're looking at data, we're looking at mm -hmm. facts, and we're deciding based on the data that that we know. So what was the data that was available for us? We started to see on our fourth wave, uh, the middle of June, we started to see more and more cases. 
from uh, the, the, the top of our uh, third wave, which was about 10,000 cases a day, one day that reached the 10,000 cases per day, uh, we went down very uh, um, I have to say, um, once the vaccination took effect, the first round of vaccination. Uh, and by the beginning of June, we were very stable at about 10, 15 cases a day. And then we started to see an increase. And in that increase, uh, we saw that we had non-immunized individuals, which we expected, but we started to see that immunized individuals were part of uh, the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic wave. And, and when we looked at the data, what was really uh, the rate of infection for those individual immunized, we saw that the people who were vaccinated early on, meaning January, had twice and sometimes three times more uh, the chance of being infected compared to those who were immunized later, um, let's say April. And so that uh, was a signal that something has to do with the time when you were vaccinating. The other part was the Delta. There was a new variant coming in. There's always a question whether this is waning immunity or, or a variant that it bypassed the, uh, the vaccine. Uh, but what we saw from the, we had two signals that it, it wasn't just the Delta. Uh, one of them is that from at the same time that we were showing uh, decreased vaccine effectiveness, uh, the UK published that their vaccine effectiveness against the same Delta was 88%. And so for us, it was at the beginning 60% then dropped to 40%. And in the UK, it was 88% for the same variant. And so that, that was suspicious. Uh, we could have said, and we said, maybe it's their protocol, maybe because they were spacing out their doses, that's the reason. But in Israel, we had... Um, the 12 to 15 years old who got vaccinated at that period of time. And so they had a fresh vaccine. And in their fresh vaccine, the vaccine effectiveness against the same variant was 90%. So it was lower than what we knew for alpha. For alpha, it was 95, 96%. It was 90%, but, but it was much high. higher. So all of those data together showed us that it's a matter of waning immunity. It was not a gamble at all. When you, based on our 12 to 15 years old, that the vaccine that we had uh, was working. And so we decided to go ahead and uh, continue with the booster uh, for the beginning, 60 years old, and, and, and uh, to open to that age group who are at, at the highest risk, and then open up uh, to younger age groups. Now, we at Haaretz have written a lot about the impact of the boosters on the, uh, the, the virus here in Israel and how we really saw a trend that over time from a, a, a pandemic that was all over the place, COVID became a pandemic of the unvaccinated, especially after the boosters came in. But maybe for some of the viewers who are less familiar with this background, if you could in maybe two minutes summarize how you see the effect of the boosters on Israel and the Delta wave. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I can if I can um, show a presentation. There is a really uh, very um, eye-opening um, graph that looks at the rate of infection for those who are 60 and above, the, the first group that we opened the booster for. And roughly two weeks after opening the booster uh, campaign for them, and they got came and got vaccinated pretty quickly, and we have high uh, coverage in that age group. Roughly two weeks after them, we started to see a drop in their infection rate, whereas the rest of the population continued to climb higher and higher. And so once we vaccinated more and more individuals and more and more age groups, at some point, we started to see a drop in the whole pandemic wave and to see the percent of uh, positive test results starting to come down. We got to about 88% positive test results. We're doing a lot of tests in Israel. So 8% of those is a lot of uh, confirmed cases. We had several days that we were uh, over 10,000 cases. Um, and so it was very clear that with the booster came the, the breakdown of this fourth wave. We saw for about six weeks a reproductive number, which is the, the criteria we're looking at to see if, oh, 
Yes, Thank we, you. we have. I'm not sure if this is. This is not what I meant, but it, but, but it's, but, but it's, it's good it's, as well. Yeah, <laughs> this is a graph we produced for our readers that was meant to explain basically the impact of, of boosters and, and maybe it, it shows some of the, the later stages of the process that you described. Basically, that we begin the boosters in, in you know, end of July, uh, uh, beginning of August, and pretty soon you really see that this line of the unvaccinated is the only one that keeps climbing and, cl and climbing and climbing. Exactly. This is why I'm saying this is not the graph that I meant, but it's a perfect graph as well, showing the same uh, picture um, that once you start the booster campaign, those who got the booster, their infection rate is coming down and the rest is cont continuing to climb. Um, and what, what was really striking is that we had a reproductive number uh, for about six weeks that was between 1.3 and 1.4. That number represents how many people an infected individual will continue to infect others. So for every person, 1.3 means that he infects another 1.3 individuals. And that means a pandemic that is growing. Um, and with that number of 1.3, 1.4, it means that the numbers that we have for confirmed cases are doubling every 10 to 14 days. And this is how we got in our fourth wave from uh, 15 cases a day uh, to over a thousand in a month and a half. And that uh, exponential climb is what we've seen in all of the, the, the waves of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but here, what was really striking to us uh, or concerning, and this is why we went for the booster campaign, is that at some point, uh, because most of the population in Israel is vaccinated, most, most of the eligible population is vaccinated, we started to see um, severe and critically ill individuals in the hospital with two doses, fully vaccinated, who have passed their, um, uh, with waning immunity, basically. Basically coming half, a, with, half a year most of the time, right? After the, yeah, the, more than the half, second dose. Yeah, about half a year, some of them more. Um, and, and about 60% of the people in our uh, ICUs were doubly uh, vaccinated individuals who were not covered anymore because of waning immunity. So when the vaccine is fresh, it covers you very well for, uh, from um, being infected, from severe disease, from mortality. We've, sh we've shown that, uh, but in, in all the countries have shown that. Uh, but once we are getting to the point of waning immunity, the waning uh, immunity starts off by having more confirmed cases, but at some points you have more uh, severe and critically ill patients. And so the, the importance of the booster is not just to stop the spread of the virus, but actually to protect people from severe disease and mortality. And that's really, I think, where we saw the biggest change, at least in the, you know, in the weeks after the booster campaign, that the number of people who are critically ill, who, who are now vaccinated with the booster was very, very low. Um, but exactly. one uh, problem that we do see is that there are still a, a pretty big pool of Israelis who got the two doses of the vaccine, but have not yet gotten a booster. Um, what do you think is the best way to communicate to that segment of the population that is not anti-vaccine because they did mm -hmm. get the two doses, but didn't go for the booster. Like, you know, like I think here in our headquarters in Haaretz, you know, I think everybody that I know is, is triple vaccinated. And, um, you know, in my immediate environment where I live in my kibbutz, it's like that. But you do meet people from time to time who did get the two shots, but have a bit, you know, less, um, uh, a bit skeptical about the, the third one. I think the, the best way to, um, to approach uh, all of that is by data. Uh, I, I think showing the data of uh, the risk of people who are not vaccinated to be severely ill, uh, obviously it goes by age. So people over the age of 60 are at higher risk of being uh, severe, um, severely ill than people who are younger. But we saw people in the ICU, uh, including um, close uh, friends of mine that did not, we, we didn't open up yet this, the, uh, the booster campaign for their age group. And they got to ICU with Corona after being doubly vaccinated. And so it can infect people between the ages of 40 to 60 with severe disease and even people under the age of 40. And so, 
understanding that this booster can really save your life. I think it's the main uh, reason to get the booster. And, and what we are trying to do is, is show it, show the impact of having uh, the booster um, for all the age groups and why it is so important to, uh, to continue being immunized, uh, basically because the people with the two doses who are not getting the booster, um, I think are feeling like they're covered, like they're immunized and they're protected. And, and with waning immunity, that's not the case. They're, they're obviously more protected than someone who has not received any dose at all. That's true. But their protection is wearing off. And, and uh, the way to increase protection again is with the booster. And so I think the, the only way is to understand who that uh, population is uh, it's mostly young people and show them the data. And this is what we're trying to do uh, all the time. Including now. Um, a, a, another question I want to ask you related to, to this issue of the waning immunity. Do you think we are expecting now a situation where you will get a COVID shot, you know, another booster every six or 12 months, like you get your flu shot every winter? Is this the reality we are expecting? That's an excellent question. It's like the million dollar question that I don't have the answer to. Uh, we don't know that yet. What I can say from preliminary uh, lab tests that we're doing in our central lab in Tel um, is that we are seeing that the um, antibodies that are created after the booster are stronger, are better, their quality is better compared to uh, the, the antibodies that uh, um, developed after the, the second shot. So I'm hopeful that this will mean that we'll have higher protection for a longer period of time, even if the number of antibodies will drop, which is usually the case in any vaccine, but their uh, quality will be so good that the protection will uh, remain longer. But we don't know that yet. This is a new virus. This is a, a new vaccine. And, and we don't really know how long uh, we'll need to continue to monitor this as exactly as we did here. And exactly as before, Israel will be the first, if there will ever be a waning again effect, we'll have to monitor and we'll have to see it first. You know, one of the challenges I think in the uh, debate on this issue is that when you ask a scientist or health experts uh, questions, a lot of times you will get an answer that is honest, which is we still are waiting for data, we still have to understand, whereas sometimes people on the other side have a very, very definitive answer, even if it's and not based on the same level of uh, science. I, I wanna move on to another issue that's very interesting to many of our readers and viewers, which is the child vaccination campaign here in Israel. Why is it important for Israel after we went through the, the booster campaign in the summer to now expand the vaccination to children between five and 11? I would start by saying that it's not important for Israel. It's important for the kids. It's not, we're not vaccinating the kids to control the pandemic. I just came back from vaccinating my two uh, younger ones, the older ones, the two older ones are already vaccinated. One, uh, one of them with a booster already. Um, and the, the other one is about to have their booster. Uh, but the two younger ones, we were actually waiting to be able to vaccinate them and protect them. I think there is a lot of sort of fake news that COVID-19 is not a child, not a childhood uh, disease. It is very true that COVID-19 is uh, more harmful for adults than for kids. That's very true. Uh, the risk of, um, of a, a child to, in their active disease, uh, go into ICU is low. Most of the kids will go through this uh, disease uh, being asymptomatic or with mild symptoms uh, out of more than half a million kids who have been confirmed in Israel since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had over 200 cases that were severe and critically ill and 11 uh, deaths, uh, most of them with kids that had risk factors. One of them uh, died and did not have a risk factor. Uh, but really the proportion is more than half a million uh, were confirmed cases and only 200 had severe and critically ill uh, disease. But the thing is, COVID-19 is not just the disease of the acute phase. So after the acute phase, there is four to six weeks after, there is the risk of PIMS, uh, which is the multi-inflammatory uh, reaction 
um, that happens. And that happens usually in kids who are healthy. And that happens and causes 60 to 70% of them going to the ICU and with a mortality of one to 2%. So in Israel, we had over 200 cases of PIMS and two mortality, one definite and one a suspected mortality of, uh, of kids who were completely healthy. And so I would not want my child to be at that risk. And then even if you go through the, the PIMS and nothing happens, um, there is some percentage and we can argue what percentage it is that has long COVID. Uh, we've seen this in adults. In adults, um, the, the research is between 10 to 30% of adults that continue to suffer from symptoms like difficulty uh, in memory and difficulty in um, active, being active, shortness of breath, uh, tiredness, uh, problems with, um, with joints, all sorts of symptoms. With kids, uh, there is more and more research coming out to show that it, th this uh, also is a phenomenon of kids. In Israel, what we've done is a, is a telephone research, a telephone, um, research um, with parents. Uh, we called nearly 14,000 uh, parents uh, of recovered kids. And we looked across Israel um, from the general population, from the Arab population, from uh, the Orthodox Jews population, different age groups, different times from the time that they recovered so between one to three months, three to six months and over six months. And what we've seen is that in the younger age groups, there, there is roughly 2% of kids who have continued symptoms. And in the older age groups, over 12, there is 4.6% of kids who continue to have symptoms. So yeah. even if, if we, we say it's not that amount, um, it's overestimating. Even if we say it's 1% of kids who are not able to do active, being active, physically active like before, having problem with memory, having problem with concentration. N nobody wants it to be in your and house. And it's 1%. And it's 1% over, uh, over half a million of kids. It's 5,000 kids in Israel. And so that is a huge thing that you want your kid to be healthy. We, we don't know um, viral infections that continue even after six months to, con to, to continue with, with symptoms like long COVID. So this is something uh, unusual and very specific for COVID. Um, and I think that the scare for me, and, and I'm an infectious disease dog, doc, the, this, the scare for me is what will happen 10 years from now? Hmm. I don't know. There are, there are viruses the 10 years and 20 years after uh, asymptomatic infection can cause horrible disease, um, meningitis, uh, being infertile, um, all sorts of problems in, in, uh, in the function of the brain, encephalitis, um, cancer. Um, we know about HIV coming in and what it happens with the immune system. So we don't know enough about COVID to say, oh, this is nothing that the kids go through this asymptomatic. Yes, the acute phase for most of the kids will go asymptomatic, but you have other um, more long effects and even a, a very big question mark about what will happen 10 and 20 years from now. And this is why I think that the, um, this disease is not something to you know, disregard. It's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, really can impact the health of our kids. And this is why we need to immunize them. It's not to break down uh, the, the pandemic in Israel. It will help that too. But, but the main reason to, uh, to immunize kids is not to protect uh, grandparents, is to protect them from something that could be, uh, could, can affect their health. And this was tour de force in, uh, in favor of child vaccination. I, I do want, if you can add a few sentences about the last part, which is what we're seeing in the countrywide numbers right now, how many of it is of the rise right now is being driven by children in the unvaccinated age groups? Yeah, so um, depending on the day, between uh, roughly 60% of the confirmed cases, there are days that it comes to 70% are, uh, are kids that are not immunized. So. Um, it has become in our fourth wave, the, the wave of the, the non-vaccinated. And since the non-vaccinated are mostly kids, 
this is now what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, infection among kids, not just kids, also adults that are not vaccinated. So it's not the wave of the kids. I don't want this uh, to be the, the, the headline. Uh, but but it is uh, part of the picture. And if at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, what we saw is a proportion compared to the proportion in the population. So if kids in Israel are about a third of the population at the beginning, before we had vaccination, there were about a third of the confirmed cases. Now they're getting to 60 and 70 percent because the vaccine is protecting uh, the other groups who are vaccinated. And how, what is the uh, level that you expect to, you know, of the population that will actually vaccinate their children? What is the response rate that you're hoping for, <laughs> expecting? Um, right now, we're talking about a few thousands of kids who have already gone through it. We saw the prime minister uh, the other day with one of his children, and you just told us that you vaccinated your own. So, so what is the, the rate of response you're expecting here? I hate to disappoint you. We don't have a number. People keep on asking me, what number? What is the target? I really, really, really don't have a target. I think our aim is to provide the best data for parents to make their decision. Um, I would like to know that every parent in Israel feels like they have uh, a way to answer the question. I understand that people are concerned and have questions. And what I, my aim is to make sure that they have a way to answer those questions and make the right decision for them and for their kids. And so this is how I look at that. There is no magic number. If we had known what is the number for herd immunity, then we could have calculated what is the target. We don't know that. And what we've seen from the first, uh, the original virus to the alpha variant, to the delta variant, that the variants keep on being more infectious, which means that the level for herd immunity keeps on going up. So there's no really magic target. Uh, what I would like is to, to know that parents are having this route to answer their questions. And I think the best way is through their ped pediatricians. Um, they trust them with everything. They have the data on the vaccine, on the disease. Um, we have a, a really uh, lengthy paper from um, the, our pediatrician uh, group in Israel that supports the, vaccin the, the vaccinations and explain about the disease and about the vaccines. And, and I would just go that route. So I don't have a magic number. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Just, when you ask, I smile because I keep on getting that question I, and I'm I keep sure. on disappointing the, the person who is asking. We're, we're looking for headlines. That always works with numbers. Uh, I, yeah, I, do, I, know. I do, I do want to ask you, um, you know, before you, you got on our uh, briefing, we were texting and we wrote something about, is this the beginning of a fifth wave, the numbers that are now going up? And then you said, we're not even past the fourth wave. Can exactly. you please explain what that means? Yeah. I don't think we can say there is a fifth wave in Israel. Not at all. We have not finished our fourth wave. Uh, we, between the, th the third and the fourth wave, we were actually were between waves. We had, you know, uh, a dozen of cases a day and we were stable and we were, um, we, we could have said we've passed the, the third wave. Here we haven't passed the fourth wave and we haven't passed it because the Delta variant is very infectious and we obviously did not get to a point of herd immunity, which we did get with the alpha variant uh, and the first vaccination campaign. Uh, here, we are not at the point of herd immunity. So the people who are immunized or protected are not able yet to protect those who are not protected. And so we are seeing those outbreaks between people who are not immunized. And so we're still dealing with our fourth wave that that is not really gone away. But I, I wouldn't call this a fifth wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good to make that distinction as well. It's uh, it's important. Uh, I want to ask you about some of the attacks that you have personally uh, faced from these anti-vaccine uh, activists here in Israel. Um, and it's not an Israeli phenomenon. I'm asking because this is something we're seeing all over the world right now, where people are taking the discourse on this issue to very extreme places, a lot of times violent places. Um, and you know, what what is your response to this? other wave that we are seeing, which is a wave of uh, incitement and disinformation around this issue. 
um, it's horrible. I, I don't have a better word. It's a it's another pandemic that happens next to the real pandemic um, that keeps on brewing with fake news, with um, um, trying to to antagonize uh, the Ministry of Health, the um, the people, higher people in, in our uh, health system uh, who are not in the Ministry of Health but are supporting vaccination. It's becoming this movement that is not driven by data. It's driven by slogans. You know, COVID-19 is not a kid's um, disease. That's slogan. It's just, it's not true. We have data to show that kids are suffering, even healthy kids are suffering from uh, COVID-19, whether in the disease itself or all the consequences, as I said. So you can't just brush it off and say, it's not a kid's vaccine. There are slogans like, you cannot really infect your grandparents because they're immunized. That's a slogan. We know that the vaccine is not 100% proof it is very efficient, but it's not 100%. So I wouldn't want uh, a, a grandparent to infect their grandparents because a grandchild to infect yeah. their grandparents because um, they think that once the, the grandparent is immunized, they're fully protected. They're very, very protected, but it's not 100%. And so there are a lot of slogans like that that makes the public um, confused about them. And, and I think that's, uh, that's the beginning. And then we're starting to see all those violent attacks. And the violent attacks are not just for um, Ministry of Health uh, officials. It's all over. We're seeing this against and doctors, uh, nurses. physicians and nurses. It's, it's something that needs to stop um, right now. And all the enforcement uh, agencies need to do uh, very rapid steps, very quickly, uh, in order to, to stop before someone will get hurt. Uh, well, last question before we get to the readers uh, and viewers questions, and we have hundreds of people on between the Zoom and arts.com and our Facebook, and you know later this will get to many more people, so this is an important one. Holiday season is upon us, Thanksgiving tomorrow in America, Hanukkah next week in Israel, and of course for Jewish communities in America and elsewhere in the world. What is the best thing to tell your unvaccinated uncle at Thanksgiving tomorrow at, or at Hanukkah, you know, uh, candle lighting next week? I have to say that I don't have unvaccinated uncle, but if I had one... <laughs> what, what would you uh, tell him? I think uh, in order to protect others, they should be, be tested. Um, what the, the policy that we've uh, implemented in Israel is not uh, a policy that says people who are not vaccinated cannot go into places. There are some countries that have done that. Um, in Israel, we haven't. We said all along, the Green Pass, you can go in being uh, immunized or recovered individuals or with a negative test. And I would uh, urge everyone who's going to dinner, um, family dinners in this holiday to be tested. Um, it's one thing to say, you know, it's a disease, it's my body, I decide not to be vaccinated, I decide if I get sick. It's another thing if you infect someone else. And, and um, that's the best advice that I have. And I think in places where there is high rate of infection, make sure that there's no big crowds. Uh, that's not the time for big crowds. We're not uh, implementing any restri restriction right now in Israel to say you cannot really gather um, more than your uh, family. We're not saying that. But if, if there is high rate of infection anywhere in the world, I would say one thing is to put, put masks on, be tested to see that you're negative and not being in um, big crowds. And maybe send that uncle also to watch our Zoom conversation later on howards.com and uh, uh, on our Facebook page so they can hear everything you said earlier about uh, vaccines. Um, moving to some questions from our audience. And again, I'm inviting people to send it, whether you are watching us on Zoom or on Facebook Live, um, please send us your questions to Dr. Ray Price. I have one question here, somebody who says they had very uncomfortable symptoms when they were vaccinated against COVID. Now it's time to vaccinate my six-year-old. 
Um, what are you seeing in terms of the side, short-term side effects for children? What should I expect if I vaccinate my child? That's a great question. So first I'll say that we started the vaccination campaign officially yesterday. And so uh, the first uh, HMO started their vaccination a day before, but in Israel, we don't have data on uh, the side effects from uh, the vaccine yet. We're gathering it. We're actually gathering it in, in, a, in a different way right now, and I can go into that if you want. Uh, but in Israel, we just started the vaccination campaign. What we've seen uh, from uh, the Pfizer uh, research is that the um, side effects, the systemic side effects that kids had uh, were similar to those with, uh, um, with older age group uh, or lower, and they have a third of the dose uh, for five to 11. It's not the, uh, the adult dose. And uh, so we're expecting to see the same uh, type of um, side effects, which means you feel kind of unwell, could be fever, could be weakness for one uh, or two days, uh, pain in the arm or redness in the arm. This is the usual side effects that we're seeing. We're ex expecting to see the same thing for five to 11. What I would say is that it means that the vaccine is working. We are giving the body this shot to say to the immune system, wake up. There is something new that you need to prepare antibodies to. And in that preparation, the, the immune response is, way, is working. Um, so that's the, the body's way to tell us that it's doing its job. Uh, another question, you know, is there any kind of anticipated timeline for vaccinating uh, children younger than five, or is that not in discussion right now? It's, it's not in discussion because it's still in research. So I think several companies are doing research to see, um, to see the effectiveness and the safety of vaccination uh, for kids who are half year old to five year old. Um, so it's in the way. I'm, I'm sure at some point it will, uh, it will be available. I just don't know the timeline. Uh, it's something that is in, in research still. Mm -hmm. Um, one question that we're getting here, what are the long-term health repercussions for COVID-19 patients who recovered? And you mentioned some of it earlier when we spoke about kids. Um, is there anything specific that people need to be aware of when they take, you know, the whole picture into consideration? So, um, what we've seen uh, in research in Israel and in other uh, countries is that between 10 to 30 percent of uh, adults can have longer symptoms that last uh, for months. We still don't know how long they last. Um, and is, it includes all the things that I said before, shortness of breath when you're doing physical activity or difficulty in physical activity, uh, problems with memory, problems, concentration, sleep uh, disturbances, uh, problems with the joints. Uh, some people are uh, telling that they have hair loss. Uh, so different types, there is loss of sense and taste uh, and people are, um, are reporting that they, it lasts I've heard even a year after recovery. So there are symptoms that are lingering for a percentage of the, of the population. Um, again, we don't know yet what might happen even longer term uh, in 10 to 20 years. We don't know that yet. There are some research um, to say that there is some effect on the brain. So they took, there is a research that uh, showed that when you're comparing MRI scans for people who did MRI for other reasons, before they got infected, and then after they got infected, they did brain MRIs, there is difference between them. And mm. it actually makes sense because if you're losing um, your taste, your sense of taste, it means that there is some neurological damage to do that. Uh, so it makes sense that there is some and memory problems and things like, like that are uh, some effect on the brain. We don't know how long it will last. Some of the people have symptoms that are resolving but we don't know what percentage and for how long. And this is part of the, uh, the big picture of saying, this is not uh, the flu. This is a different virus that has symptoms that are, are lingering, could have longer effect, and we need to take this uh, virus seriously. Two questions related to the boosters from uh, viewers. Ronnie asks, are there any signs right now that the booster immunity is waning in any way? And Maria is asking, can you confirm that the booster will provide effectiveness for a, a, until a later stage than the second shot? 
So we're not seeing any evidence that the booster is waning right now. We are following this very closely. Uh, we are uh, seeing most of the confirmed cases among people uh, who are not immunized or have been immunized but did not get the booster, so their uh, immunity is waning. Uh, we are not seeing uh, an inc an, an, a significant increase in the number of people uh, who are uh, have booster and are and are sick and are getting infected. Um, we are seeing to some extent this increase, but, but on the other hand, the population of people who got the booster is growing all the time and it's the more elderly. So when, when we take this into consideration, we're not seeing any waning immunity from the booster yet. As I said before, we are seeing very uh, optimistic signs in the lab that the antibodies that are created in the booster are stronger, are better quality. Uh, so even if there is decrease in the number of them, each one of them is like stronger and doing their work better. Uh, and we don't know yet how long this uh, will take effect. Hopefully it will be longer than six months. Uh, one question we're getting from uh, Andy, does Israel have any data on uh, kind of like maybe a mixed booster? You know that right now it's, it's basically all coming from different companies. Is that going to change in the future? So in Israel now, we're uh, allowing booster from all types, from Pfizer, from Moderna, from AstraZeneca. We're actually recommending AstraZeneca for people who cannot get uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, but we don't have a lot of data about that, uh, mainly because um, it took us some time with Moderna to get to the point where we were allowed to get Moderna as a, as a booster. Uh, they went over. They they went through their process of approving uh, their booster shots by the FDA, and they actually approved it with a half a dose. So we needed to wait to get their approval of uh, how to vaccinate with the booster uh, for Moderna. But there is a lot of research in the world showing that heterogeneous uh, or mixing a vaccine is working. It's it's usually better off if uh, you add mRNA vaccine to a non-mRNA uh, vaccine. Um, so then it compares to being uh, triply vaccinated or doubly vaccinated with uh, mRNA vaccines that are, are more effective uh, when, we, when you compare the effectiveness of the vaccines. So the mixing is, is uh, there's a lot of research from the world about that. That's interesting stuff and I have to say, for me, quite amazing that I can listen to your answer and understand most of it, something that two years ago I could not imagine. But, you know, we've been reading and hearing about this stuff so much that people are, are learning the terms. A question from Elise, what is the minimum antibody level that is required to prevent symptomatic disease and the minimum required to prevent severe disease? That's a perfect question that hopefully we'll have the answer to uh, in a few weeks. So we don't know yet what is the level, or what is the correlate of protection? What is the level of antibodies that you say above it, you're protected, you're not going to get sick, uh, you're not going to be infected, or you're not going to have uh, severe disease. What I uh, just mentioned is that we are in the wrap up phase of a research that we uh, in the Ministry of Health did with uh, Sheba. Medical Center, where we took, uh, we, we um, did a research with uh, confirmed cases. We took their family members who were vaccinated and enrolled them into the study. And then we um, asked them at the beginning and at the end to do a PCR test to see who got infected and to do certain types of measurement for the immune system. So level of antibodies, level of neutralizing antibodies, and uh, to some percentage of them, cell immunity tests. And what we are trying to see, if there is this correlator of prote protection, if we can say people uh, from family members who are close contacts and there is high risk of infection, if you had antibody level above a certain number, then you did not get infected. So 10 days after, in the second PCR, they did not get infected. And we're trying to uh, to see if we can get to this number. This number is not yet known, but hopefully we'll have the result in a few weeks. Uh, questions from uh, viewers, readers in Europe. Uh, we're seeing a lot of governments in Europe right now adopt uh, all kinds of restrictions, lockdowns, um, things that we had in Israel before and, and now we haven't had for a long time. Um, 
can the booster shots that are being introduced in many uh, European com uh, many European countries um, prevent those kinds of measures in your view? So it's it's hard for me to give advice to other countries. Every country is in their uh, different uh, place and uh, you know contexts and culture and and other things. So um, I'm I'm really not able to tell other countries what to do. But I can say from the experience in Israel that the only thing that has gotten us out of waves really for a long period of time was the vaccination. So the first vaccine campaign. Uh, got us out from the third wave and we were open we were able during the during in the midst of this wave to open up economy uh, with a green pass which we installed uh, insult in, installed back then um, and open up even even at the time when we had 6,000 cases and 3,000 cases we opened up more and more and more and what we saw in our fourth wave is that with a quick booster campaign, we were able to um, to not to, to do minimal restrictions. So we reinstalled the Green Pass. But other than that, nothing uh, closed. So uh, we asked people when they come to crowded places um, to to show a Green Pass with his, as I said before, immunized, recovered, or negative test result uh, in order to get into uh, certain places. Uh, but other than that, there was no lockdown, there was no curfew. Uh, we actually opened schools September 1st, even though we had a large number of uh, cases um, at that period of time. So I think what we are seeing is that the vaccination works, at least in Israel, it worked. And we're able to get us uh, through the fourth wave or out of the fourth wave. We're not completely over it, as I said, um, with, the, with the booster. So, so yes, I think... If, if, if it's possible, I would go with a booster uh, campaign um, in order to minimize other restrictions. Uh, we'll just take one or two more questions because we are aware of the, the time uh, commitment that uh, we agreed on. Um, and again, we wanna really thank you, Dr. Sean Marie Price for being with us. Um, one question that we have has to do with um, travel uh, entry into Israel. And we've published about this at Haaretz, and today there was also a report in Yediot that there are loopholes in the system that can uh, can be used by people who are not vaccinated to get an entry permit into the country. And Green Pass, uh, our reporter, Ellison Kaplan Sommer, has been writing a lot about this recently. Um, what is being addressed? What is being done to address this problem? So uh, we actually opened up uh, some. Uh, opening to people who uh, in the fourth wave, even though they were immunized uh, in the fourth wave, got infected abroad. We had about 4,000 of them um, that we know of and probably more. Um, and we wanted to allow them to ask for a green pass uh, and not be sort of trapped, even though epidemiologically they are at very low risk because they were immunized, they got infected, they, they stand uh, with our uh, criteria for who is protected. But because it happened abroad, we don't have the data and so they're not really known in the system. And so we were trying to, um, to open this uh, opportunity for people to report and then obviously upload their vaccination status or uh, their uh, recovery uh, documents. Um, once we've seen that this is being um, used or abused uh, by people uh, to avoid vaccination and get a green pass, we actually took off uh, that option to report and while you were in Israel and to report um, and get a green pass even though you're not entering um, Israel, and I have to say, it's it's we're constantly in this battle of are we trying to let the people who uh, want to lie and want to cheat um, make us uh, create the policy for the rest hmm. of us? Um, and so we need to balance because there there people who are really um, they really need to get. Um, to get a status of being protected. It's not just for the Green Pass. If you're considered protected, it means that when you come in contact with a confirmed case, you don't need to go into isolation. So for me, if, the, if someone, for example, did their two shots, went abroad, got infected, I know that they're protected. It, it, 
you know, tears my heart that just because of bureaucratic uh, problems, we're not able to say, yes, you're protected. You don't need to go into isolation when you're confirmed. And when we're trying to, you know, make, create that route in order for them to declare something, then we have all the rest of the people who want to lie and cheat use that route. So we need to balance it. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult balance, but we're trying to close all the holes in the system uh, that we can, and we know that it's is not never going to be a hundred percent perfect, but we're trying to improve all the time. We will keep following, and thank you for that explanation. The last thing uh, that I want to ask, and this is a bit represents a lot of questions that we are getting from uh, people, um, which is really how much can you uh, trust today um, the mechanism that we have, whether it's the vaccines or the new medications that we have now, uh, and when you look ahead. After almost two years of this battle with COVID, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic about the, the next uh, stage of this pandemic here in Israel and maybe even more broadly? I'm very optimistic. I think once we have got in a, a very short time, we got to a very effective um, spectrum of vaccine. And it's not just one vaccine, but several vaccines that are working. And we know that they're working. I know that we have the tool to win this pandemic. We've shown it. Uh, so now it's a matter of knowing how often do you need to get vaccinated? How do you get the population to be vaccinated? But that's, that's the tool. So we're looking always uh, ahead and we're uh, monitor, monitoring the world to see if there are more difficult variants and more scary variants, those that will pass vaccination, that will, that will be more violent. Uh, and that's a risk. Uh, but I think the tool is vaccination. And once more and more of the population of the world will be vaccinated, the, 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 the spread of the virus will come down and the a creation of variants within that virus will come down. And it's either going to uh, be eliminated or go into this endemic stage where you have outbreaks here and there, but it's not a pandemic that is really killing people all over the world. Um, so I'm optimistic. We have the vaccine. Uh, we have tools, as you said, uh, that are working, that are the uh, medications. But I think the medications is not, it, it, that's not the game changer. The game changer are the, the vaccine. Okay, um, so with that optimism, uh, which is not something we always have in the discussion of COVID, we uh, have to end. And I really want to thank, uh, first of all, all of our viewers, whether you joined us on Zoom, Facebook Live, haaretz.com. Uh, and this uh, great uh, uh, briefing will be available later to watch as well and share from haaretz.com, from our Facebook page, from YouTube. And I want to thank Dr. Sharon and Ray Price for taking the time today to speak with us, to answer all of the tough questions we're getting from readers from around the world. Um, so again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, of course, to encourage everyone who watched this on all platforms to keep following our reporting on arts.com about COVID in Israel and in general, and uh, to stay safe now, whether you're uh, going to Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, or just any other uh, gathering to stay safe. Um, thank you. And uh, goodbye now. Happy from holidays. The Haaret. Yes. Okay. Chag Sameach. Uh, Chag and, good, and goodbye now from the Haaretz headquarters in Tel Aviv. Thank you.